So we're going to go one at a time. And what I've asked these folks to do is address the questions that we also included in the Eventbrite invitation. What should researchers be thinking about and doing? And what should journalists be thinking about and doing as we anticipate uh, the next storm and look at the cumulative effects of storms? So um, we'll start at the end. Uh, we have some different perspectives. And what I want you to do also is think about what you would say to these questions, because we're going to work to uh, be succinct and leave uh, some time in this half hour period to hear uh, responses from you to these key questions. So we're going to start with Courtney per uh, Peragallo. Yes. Um, and Courtney works for Black River Health Services, which is a nonprofit organization through the North Carolina Farm Worker Health Program. Uh, providing health services and doing community outreach to Spanish-speaking migrant farm workers. So right now she's working on a tri-county disaster resilience plan among migrant farm workers in Pender, Sampson, and Bladen County. So thank you, Courtney. Go. Thank you very much for having me. Um, did you want me to? Go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, so for me, this is something I'm super passionate about. I'd be more than willing to talk to any of you guys if you had any questions for me. But I think the biggest gap I've come across since last year was the inclusion of the migrant farm worker population, um, specifically materials and resources and even just communication that is in Spanish and that is also culturally relevant and competent to that population. It's really important that being kind of an outsider from that population, you don't want to have the first time that you're intervening be after a disaster. It's so important to build trust and to um, not only increase their knowledge, but also to equip them with skills and materials that they're comfortable using to apply for future events of a storm. Um, I think it's just not enough to give the education. You really need to empower this community and include them in planning, in um, even things where engaging stakeholders, important resources that you may come across, because these resources, for example, for me, was meeting with emergency management. I'm able to now look at implementing a emergency text message system prior to disaster that individuals can opt in and select Spanish as a language, which is really key to getting them um, to their phones, which a lot through observation and outreach, a lot of migrant farm workers do have cell phones. So this would be something that would be important. And not only that, but just in order to gain support and maybe have bilingual shelters near areas where there are thousands of migrant farm workers who would otherwise not be aware of these resources or maybe even not even have these resources to them. So I think the main point, um, even for you all, is to look at no matter if you're a reporter or if you're working on a public health initiative, to really look at your resources, look at things that have been successful with other storms like Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico with that Spanish speaking population, see what works and see what your resources can really do to help you further reach your goals on your project. Great, thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Um, we're gonna uh, shift over to this end. Okay. Uh, Frank Tercy, who many of you know, is a veteran environmental journalist, uh, was at the Winston-Salem Journal uh, during my time in Raleigh. I found a Coastal Review online. He continues to write about climate change studies and uh, research and impact. And he's the mayor pro tem of Swansboro, a resident. And so he has a lot of uh, large stake in these issues. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you, Melanie. Um, the journalists in the room, you know, I've been there. I've, I've, I've covered every major hurricane to hit the Carolinas since Hugo in 89. So I know how you all think. I know the adrenaline rush you feel as you're the only, you, 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 and, you and the emergency vehicles are, are, are the only vehicles heading east on, on I-40. Everybody, and then while, while the westbound lanes are packed with evacuees. 
Um, I know what it's like to have to cover a major breaking event. Um, the aftermath, the recovery, the heartbreaking stories of people who lose everything. As a government official, as an elected official in a little coastal community, I also know what it's like to have to deal with the recovery after a major storm. Um, what I as a journalist fail to do, and what I hope as an elected official I will not fail to do, is to break out of that mold. Because it's the continuing cycle of storm, damage, recovery, rebuilding, and we start all over again. Um, as a reporter, I didn't rarely report on that. Um, it was, it was, you know, the, the 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 breaking news event, and doing all I could to make sure that was covered. I never really thought about the aftermath and and the continuing cycle of this. Well, we can no longer afford to ignore that. Um, Florence was a Category One storm, and the scale of things, it wasn't a, a very major hurricane. It hung around for three days. It dumped 37 inches of rain on Swansboro. I noticed we were in the middle of the red zone on one of those uh, slides this morning of rainfall. Um, I was sitting at on a board meeting um, the other day, and one of the buildings that was totally destroyed, well, most of our waterfront was flooded. Several of the buildings were totally destroyed. Um, one of those buildings has been rebuilt, and some guy wants to open a pizza parlor in it. He comes to the board asking for a special use permit. He shows us his elevation uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers. His ground floor is three feet above sea level. I told him I had, there's no ordinance in my community that would force me to deny this permit, that I will vote with the others because I had no other way, there's no, no justification to vote no, but I warned him that this, your business will be gone. The next storm, um, you'll, you'll, you will lose um, what you invest in this business. Um, we. Have no, we, we, we have nothing on our books that will say you can't do this, so go ahead and do it, but be warned that this will happen again. Um, I have attended, as a journalist, dozens of conferences just like this. They're all very good, they're all very informative, but I can tell you that the rest of the folks who sit on the board with me have no idea. They're not in this room. They can't. They don't know the connections between filling a wetland and what it might do for flooding in the future, or building that Walmart on that big open space in that floodplain, and what that might mean when the next hurricane comes. So one of the challenges we face is getting this message to those people, because they make decisions every single day. Every time they meet, there there is some development decision that all the issues you heard about this morning, they're faced with, and they have no earthly idea of generally what they're doing. And that's, that's, a, that's the truth of it. It's very frustrating for me at times sitting on the board, but we need to educate those people. And so I, I think the real message for journalists, for researchers, is the message we heard today in this room has to go out to that wider audience um, in our communities to people, voters who vote for these folks, and then these people who make these decisions every time they meet with no real connection about any of this. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, Karen, I'm Spocker. She says the most important thing that you all need to know about her is she's from Corkers Island. <laughs> and uh, she is curator of the Corsau Museum, uh, and, which is a community resource beyond any usual definition of museum. And uh, she's committed to the communities of Corsau and beyond, and she says those tribes of people tied to the edge. And so thank you for being here, Karen. And I know she's got a couple things to share with you. 
Yeah, I wrote it all down, so we won't have time for all that. But, and I love being beside Frank Tercy because uh, we have a history. Yeah, this is not our first rodeo. <laughs> and we're not over yet. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for allowing voices to be in this room today uh, in, a, in a group of agencies and academics that I sometimes try to avoid. Uh, but you all are the ones with the statistics and the research and all the tools that are necessary to get the attention of those people who are not in the room today and who are on Jones Street today making decisions that will filter down to the board of the town of Swansboro. So thank you for, for letting me be here. I invite all of you as journalists and or others to come on down to the edge where we deal with realities rather than research. There's sometimes a difference between the two. Thank you for the work you do. I invite you to get involved with the people part of what you're talking about. Resilience, I'm sick of that word. <laughs> That's your word. For us, it's strength, determination, modify and adapt, Hold on, deal with it day after day. This coming Saturday at my, still got a little bit of mold building at the end of the road on Harker's Island. We're moving the kitchen in today after a three and a half million dollar rebuild that will be going on until spring. We are celebrating the Diamond City homecoming. Diamond City was those collection, was that collection of communities on Shackleford Banks that moved after the great storm of 1899, a Category 5 San Sariaco storm that came and wiped out those communities. My grandmother was born there. She moved to Harker's Island in 1903, and her father bought 60 acres on Harker's Island for $60, and I'm here to tell you that my family's still on a piece of that land, and that's a huge victory. But we're going to celebrate those ties 120 years later on Saturday because we refuse to give up at that place. We're going to the cemetery. We're going to celebrate back at the museum. Then we're going to the lighthouse to renew those bonds. What's changed since 1899? Our expectations. My grandmother did not have any expectations beyond what she was going to eat that day, raising a family. There was no communication. It was a storm flag in Beaufort that somebody might have heard about. They, Jim Cantori did not, <laughs> did not exist. Uh, it was a subsistence living, and they lived there until the salt water got in their wells, and they had to move inland. Most of them moved right across, across back sign to Harker's Island to higher ground. Another thing that's changed, we got more people, and some of them don't have a clue. I suggest for some, some agency here have a newcomer's guide to all those people who are coming in here and filling in those wetlands and buying on the ocean and tell them what, you know, what the score is. Let them know. If they want to take that risk, that's fine. But let them know that nobody's coming to get them. So, I mean, that, that's a real issue before, during, and especially after because they all think the roofer is there for them, for their second home. Now, the roofers need to be there for the people who are living under tarps or living in their cars. The other big change that nobody talks about is that coastal land has evolved from a place to work to a place to play and invest. That's a different, that's a different situation. On Hatteras, after Isabel, when the road got broken up, you wanna know who the first people back on the ground were? It was the fishermen. Same thing down east. The fishermen are part of the solution, not the problem. Because they had boats, they could get dirty clothes back and forth from Hatteras to Buxton to get them washed. They, they know how to work with it. They know how to prepare. In down east Carter County, the only boat I know of was uh, Larry Kellum's that got washed up in the marsh and the fishermen all went together and pulled it back off. They know what to do. Some of this crowd coming in don't. I encourage you to come and understand how Florence has changed the conversation. 
Now it's not a storm, and it's the cumulative impact like Donna spoke to. Isabel in 2003, Irene, and now Florence. People are raising their houses. People are talking about the next storm. They are even saying the word climate change and sea level rise in meetings, in the press. It's real. It's been real a long time. And if there's anything to thank Florence for, it's that that reality has come to, come to bear. I, incur, I invite all of you to come and help tell that story. We are tired. We are very tired. And the land is weary. But we're worth coming to talk to. People are a part of this ecosystem. And it's really easy to measure, and I'm a, you know, I'm, I someday would have wanted to be a math major. I love all the statistics and the infographics and the charts and all that stuff. That's wonderful. It's very visible. Our story is not so much visible as it is audible in their voices, in the look in their eye, the weariness. But we're part of it, and we're a part of this great state. And I'm not talking about Donald Trump's great word. I'm talking about the greatness that comes out of the people, of their hearts, their spirit. We've been there. In fact, we were there first. This state was settled east to west. And we've been adapting, and we've been working, and we've been modifying and adjusted all these years. Come tell that story in a, in a new way, because at the end of the day, that wetland is important to all of us, people included. I'm really glad that this conference and, and the conversation is going statewide because we have to put up with what you all do wrong in Raleigh and Fayetteville. And, you know, I mean, it all ends up, it goes downhill, it ends up there. Noose River still hasn't re re recovered, Pamlico Sound, from Isabel and Floyd all those years ago. We deal with your mistakes. So, so think about that holistically. Policy and politics are the only way to get real change on the ground as far as water quality and reconstruction rules. That, please, to keep pushing. The legislature sets those rules, and nobody's going to going to do those things just because it's the right thing to do. They're going to do, developers are going to do what they're forced to do, right Frank? Yes ma'am. And, and the word now is at CAMA, it's not a question of the permit, it's, you know, just get them the permit. And that's not doing any of us any good. But the paperwork is different. I encourage you to come now. Not when the store, not, not don't get there just before Jim Cantori or just after Jim Cantori. Make a commitment to these communities that start now, before, and build some trust. We don't, I'm sorry to tell you, but we really don't need another plan. And we really don't need another process. We need people who we can trust that will come in and help us. It's got to come from the bottom up if it's going to work in a community like mine, of independent fishermen, anti-government people who have had their land taken away by government, by who've had to live with their rules. We're at the end of the road, literally. But we're staying there. Ernie Foster, from my buddy from Hatteras, go to Nat Geo video and keep, keep Googling about sea level rise. He was interviewed there a couple years ago. It's powerful, powerful interview and he's in the cemetery because in my world everything begins and ends in the cemetery. But he was in the cemetery with the reporter and they were walking around all the graves of his families and he got to the point and he said, and I'll be buried here. And so that was, he gave us some silence and then he said, and you know what, paraphrasing, if I wash away with this land, so be it. Why should I be any different than the trees and the animals and the other systems that are here? I am part of this place, and I'll go with it. So that's my story. Thank you for that, Karen. Now it's your turn. <laughs> you, you got the solution. You are. My, my new buddy. <laughs> Michael, sorry about that. But Michael Davis is a, a veteran journal, journalist. He veteran was, means old. Go ahead. Uh, news leader, 
former newspaper editor, and he is now uh, the Southern Regional Manager for the Solutions Journalism Network and the project editor of the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative, which is looking at a topic that we talked about earlier, which is affordable housing. We are. Yes, you are a quote machine, girl. Yes. <laughs> a reporter's T dream. Ten cent a piece. <laughs> Ten cent a piece. I got a building to rebuild. <laughs> Y'all haven't talked about insurance either. That's another meeting I want to go to. It's All insurance. Right. All right. A, a show of hands, please. Uh, the non-journalists in the room. The non-journalists. Yes. Oh, great. Okay, non-journalists. Do you ever feel like you're just getting pounded by news media with problem after problem after problem? Yes or no? Does the news seem relentlessly sort of negative and dark and problem-centric? Yes, I see some people nodding. All right, okay. Well, it is. That's the truth. Uh, whether you're talking about uh, television, radio, uh, or, or, or uh, legacy print media, um, it, it is relentlessly problem and conflict centered. Um, and we've relied on that model for a very long time. Um, Solutions Journalism Network uh, is aspiring to sort of rebalance the news and uh, to remind journalists and our audiences that there are great and important stories to report about how people are responding to problems. We say, yes, continue to do great investigative work. Yes, report about the problems, but please finish the job. And you finish the job by reporting on how people outside of your community are responding to the problem that's right in front of your face. So. We give travel grants and we give money to uh, address these kinds of, uh, of problems and stories in, in, in newsrooms across the continent. Uh, so, you know, if, if rising tides are, uh, are, are you, you know, the, the pressing problem in your community, uh, you can apply to us for a grant and, uh, and uh, if, if things work out and the stars align, uh, you could go somewhere else in this country or, uh, or overseas to report on uh, how other people are responding, what, what they're doing. And that reporting has to be substantive. It has to be rigorous. Uh, it has to be, um, um, how should I put this? It has to have teeth. Right? There's nothing squishy about solutions journalism. Uh, it's evidence-based. And, um, and it also has to point out the limitations of the response. That keeps it from being advocacy, which solutions journalism is not. It's not ad advocacy. It's just good, hard reporting. So just this morning, I about uh, jumped out of my seat as uh, we were talking about the Lloyd Ray Farm. You all remember that discussion about uh, biogas? And um, it, it was a discussion where we learned about this um, project undergoing. It's uh, uh, funded by very reputable organizations. Uh, some good things are coming as a result of it, but there are also limitations. And one of the limitations is that it costs $600,000 more to uh, create that kind of a farm than it would uh, an another kind of farm that's not using that technology. Okay, so there's limitations, but you know we also heard the evidence of uh, the success that they're having. So let's say we're in New Orleans. Uh, Solutions Journalism says, well, go to that farm, do the reporting, do you know, shoot it get it on video and bring it back to your audience in New Orleans and share it with them. So what does it do? It changes the conversation in town. That's what you want to do. First and foremost is get people thinking that a problem is no longer intractable. We, we tend to think that our problems can't be solved when, when they're deep and onerous, but the truth is, that, that's why we're here on Earth, to solve problems and to mitigate against problems. So uh, solutions journalism, when, when you do it well, um, it, it, it's great for the community because it changes the discussion in town and sometimes leads to you know community experimenting with, with, with what you've reported. Um, and then um, it, it, it does provide conversational fodder uh, and, and oftentimes, it takes excuses away from elected officials if they say, there's nothing we can do about it. When you show them that 
over here, at two counties away, there, there, there is something you can do about it, and it doesn't cost a ton of money. It takes their excuse away. Uh, that's good old-fashioned journalism right there. So th that, in a nutshell, is uh, what solutions journalism is. The thrilling part of being here today with you is like I heard so many little examples during the the conversation about what the uh, from the eyewitnesses about things that they're actually doing, you know, as a result of Florence in anticipation of the next storm. I'm saying report about that. Okay. Let people know about that. That's okay. Okay. Can I stop you there now. Okay. All right. I think my sermon's over. Passionate about <laughs> he is. Um, he is available. He's a great resource to talk to you more about that, and he'll be here through the afternoon. Um, Allison, how are we on time? Well, we're, I think we need some time for audience. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, thank you to all four. Really wonderful, uh, wonderful thoughts. Um, so we'd love to hear from you. Uh, what should reporters be doing? What should journalists be focused on? What should researchers be doing? Um, I'm Mac Ledgerton. I'm Donna's spouse down in Robinson County. Um, I've been working for 40 years in nonprofit in the, on the grassroots level in community empowerment and community development. And seeing the disaster system it really hasn't learned much about community empowerment and community development and how those two fields have advanced. So uh, this was called a lightning session. So I'm just going to list, and I'm also a researcher, so I'm just going to list some of the gaps in the system that aren't, that are rarely even identified, much less addressed. Um, the first is the lack of an integrated case management system on the local level. Every agency has its own set of clients. Not one agency on a county or city level can tell you where all the people are in the recovery process. Second, nobody's researched the data on the level of money that's given from FEMA. How much below 5,000, 5 and 10, 10 and 15, or how many uh, appeals we've had on the county level how many appeals were filed and how much money was given in that appeal. So there's a lot of data, quantitative data, that we still need to get. Um, there's also a lack of free and accessible legal assistance for survivors, a big gap. And we had it back in the 90s in North Carolina. Um, disaster preparedness, that's done by the agencies, but there's very rarely done on a community level, community-based neighborhood level. There's very little done. Um, also, we need to build local capacity for mucking and gutting and mold remediation. I'm a minister, but this pattern of church groups coming in and not building capacity and just doing it for people does not work. They have to come back every single hurricane. We're not building local community capacity to do this ourselves. Um, on that note, the agencies are doing recovery for and to people not with the equal partners. Um, and nobody's tracking what I would call the disaster diaspora. Donna mentioned it. And nobody's tracking this issue of the, the lack of predatory leasing laws in the state that we see with the disasters. We have predatory lending laws, but no predatory leasing laws. Um, and lastly, a big one for all of us in Eastern North Carolina, our poverty is back to what it was in the 70s. Nobody's covering that. And these disasters really exacerbate it completely. And all we're getting in North Carolina are more industry related to the two causes of climate change. Massive expansion of fossil fuels in eastern North Carolina and massive expansion of industrial agriculture, hogs and chickens. The chickens have no permits for them. Biogas is not a good solution, and we have massive deforestation in eastern North Carolina that no one's writing about. Our, our part of North Carolina is, the, is actually the Amazon of our state, and we just don't even, we treat it like it's a, the dump. It's also where the greatest poverty is where most of our Native American and African American people live. It's the most racially diverse rural area 
of the entire United States. And we need our universities and our journalists to recognize the challenges that we face in Eastern North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. Other thoughts? What should we be focused on? What should we be doing? We hit that after, after lunch lag. Stretch <laughs> break. Uh, all right, well, we do have a. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right, that's wonderful. Yes. Okay, speaking as a recovering journalist, somebody who gave up on all that, uh, for each or any of you who would uh, want a reporter to come out and cover the subject matter that you each talk about, how would you advise that person to pitch that idea to their editor? since they are dealing now with a much reduced uh, workforce and a lot of uh, cuts in expense or budgets, how would you impress upon them the urgency, the newsworthiness of uh, what you want them to do in a way that might appeal to somebody who's got to run the rest of the newspaper or the radio station or whichever outlet they're dealing with? You know, we have research that shows that people really appreciate it and want it and recognize it when they see it and feel relief when they read those kinds of stories. Uh, that you're doing yourself a great favor in, in times when there's retrenchment from uh, readers and viewers and, and listeners. Uh, if you can give people something that they actually want, what, what, Mr. Editor or Miss Editor, uh, why, why shouldn't we be doing these stories? That's what I would say. But we must do these stories. Otherwise, we're going to be like that ship captain that has one finger up as you know, sinking into the sea saying, but we're right, but we're right. Why, you know, we've got to change our patterns in, in journalism and, and respond in new ways. And this is just one way. OK, I want to go next. Courtney? Um, uh, it's kind of a subject where I feel like with the farm worker community, it's really important to make them aware, not just on the side of the reporter, but I think it's a bit more of a delicate situation. Um, I remember an article last year, there was a camp of workers that we were helping that there was an article out showing them just carrying their belongings through the water because nobody had told them that there was a storm. Their crew leader evacuated and didn't tell them about where to go. So I feel like almost in a way of kind of putting yourself in the situation, like imagine if I didn't know that a hurricane was going to come and I'm walking out of my house with just whatever I can carry. Um, I think that it might be best to kind of document when that's happening so it increases other people's awareness and kind of motivates other people to get involved with that population. It's kind of harder after the fact when they're in recovery because a lot of them are fearful of people coming onto the property. They are feel fearful of if they're undocumented. So I think it's kind of a two-sided issue. Being able to portray it in a way that people are understanding and motivated to help, but also protecting the identity and protecting the privacy of these individuals. Thank you. Karen, I think, I think it gets back to responsibility. And I know that newspapers uh, run for a bottom line, and I appreciate how their, um, their struggles, but there's a responsibility I believe as a journalist to address the human side of issues and and I do believe that journalism should tell the whole story so so that that's my argument that you know you can you can do the Jim Cantori I know on his case today there should be a board game too for some entrepreneur out there. Where the hell is John, John, uh, Tom, Jim Cantore? But um, to 
<laughs> to look at the holistic community that they're trying to, to cover, whether it's the state or the region, that these human stories are valuable. They may, and they do pay off in the end because I think those of us who are still newsaholics and like paper news, uh, we, we are the human people, you know, and, and social media and the internet, I mean, people have more access to news now than they've ever had. And how do you get somebody to stop on your Facebook feed, and I'm a Facebooker, I'm old, can't help it, um, to, it's usually the photograph. It's the photograph that draws me in and a cut line to the story. And so I think that's a part of this whole journalism is, you know, where is the photojournalism? Um, and we did some powerful exhibit last summer called Rising, which really started the conversation before the storm. It was in the, exhibit, in the museum when the storm came, but it was all about the changing landscape. So I, I think visuals, we're a visual society. Those infographics grab attention, but so do hum, human faces. Though I gave up on editors a long time ago, um, I, I don't think this is a hard story to sell. Um, as, as Karen notes, there's the human element, and any editor who doesn't see that human element doesn't belong in the business. Um, I think every good reporter knows his or her editors, um, and he or she knows what flips their switches. Uh, so if you, if you have an editor who is really keen on fiscal issues, uh, for instance, you can certainly sell a, this story uh, as why do we keep spending public resources continually, time and time again, uh, to fix the same problem? Uh, should, should not those, re shouldn't those resources be better spent preventing uh, this problem in the future? So I, I think you know most most good journalists are pretty good at manipulating their editors, um, and, and so <laughs> so I, I, I but I really don't think that this story has such large public policy implications, has such a compelling human element that I don't really think it, it is a hard sell. It, it's just we we have to commit ourselves as journalists to go beyond just the normal cycle of disaster, relief, recovery, rebuild, and do it all over again, and, and, and start stepping out, finding the solutions uh, to what is going to be a recurring problem here on the coast. And um, for little communities like Swansboro, you know, we, we can't, as a community, we can't afford many more Florences. Um, and, and so we have to figure out how are we going to prevent that kind of damage in the future? And, um, and anything we can do to educate the voting public in Swansboro and in other coastal communities and the elected people who are elected to represent them um, can only help, uh, help us mitigate what, what is certainly this coming storm that, 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 is, that we're facing. Well, thank you. Let's give uh, a hand to our...